drink in and deeply reflect on the, the beauty and the salt and the light, I think, that the, the book of Matthew has been providing us. Let us also be reminded of something about the author himself. Our Jewish Matthew was not an eyewitness to anything he was reporting. He doesn't claim to be. The disciple Matthew was a tax collector. While writers of the gospel were usually literary experts, often making a living from it as a profession, even if it wasn't their only occupation. So all indications are this is not the same Matthew that was an original disciple of Christ. So Matthew the gospel writer had to do extensive research of documents for information about Yeshua's life and his ministry, and also would have conducted interviews with some folks who, who may have been eyewitnesses to it. He would have had to familiarize himself with some matters of which he didn't personally have any expertise. So he would have sought out those who were knowledgeable in that field. And before I say another word, I would be remiss if I didn't credit the Holy Spirit and divine inspiration for leading and directing Matthew's writing. And as an aside, he probably, mostly, if not completely, was unaware of God's hand upon him. And this was in order to provide us with the truthful, with the invaluable information that we have before us today. Now, because he was a Jewish believer who probably lived in the Holy Land, near to the temple, uh, near to synagogue leadership, a man who we will soon see had considerable depth of Torah knowledge, as well as a solid grasp of Jewish tradition, he would have had little to do with pagan astrology, because such a thing was shunned, especially with the more strict segments of Jewish society. Thus, in his birth story of Jesus, wherein he placed considerable relevance on, on the visitation of the Magi, the other gospel writers never mention it. He would have had to seek out those who practiced astrology for their knowledge on the subject. Now, I point this out because I, perhaps you too, were quite struck with Matthew's use of technical astrological terms and phrases that only a few experts would have known. Terms and phrases to help describe the Magi's discovery of the, the heavenly portent of a new king of the Jews being born in Judea. A portent known in Christianity as the Star of Bethlehem. Now, I suspect that Matthew might not have been all that surprised that pagan stargazers from a distant land had received knowledge of Christ's birth. And while it's true that the Magi didn't in any way think of this child as divine or as a Messiah, but rather as an earthly king, nonetheless, it was not mere coincidence that in using the celestial zodiac and astrological reckoning, they were, by Matthew's account, the first to know of Christ's advent, even before the Jews did. While that might seem odd to us, the biblical pattern may just reveal that for his own good reasons, this is how God has always intended it. When I look at a listing of, of Old Testament prophecies put together by the classic Christian scholars that predict the coming of a Messiah, I have yet 
to run across one that includes the story of Balaam and Balak in the book of Numbers. There probably is one, but I've never found it. And yet, Jewish sages and scholars have for millennia emphasized this story, and especially Balaam's speech in Numbers 24, as a clear, as a powerful prophecy about a Messiah for Israel that's going to come from the tribe of Judah that seems to even include a celestial portent. Listen to Numbers 24, 15 through 17. So he, this is Balaam, made his pronouncement. This is the speech of Balaam, son of Beor, the speech of a man whose eyes have been opened, the speech of him who hears God's words, who knows what Elion knows, who sees what Shaddai sees, who has fallen, yet has open eyes. I see him now, but not now. Behold him, but not soon. A star will step forth from Jacob. A scepter will arise from Israel to crush the corners of Moab and destroy all the descendants of Shet. See, Balaam was a pagan magi, just as were the magi who visited the Christ child. In Numbers, we have Balaam making this incredible prognostication that one would think would only come from the lips of a great sage of Israel, or perhaps a, a venerable Hebrew prophet. But no, this comes from the mouth of a pagan magi. So why does Matthew give so much attention to the magi? when none of the other gospel writers even mention them. And why doesn't Matthew wonder out loud about the seemingly ironic reality that pagan astrologers were the first to learn of Messiah's coming, and this was due to some confluence of stars and planets in the sky? I could only speculate that because of the Jews' belief that the Balaam speech was prophetic of a Messiah, which included even the mention of a star, a Torah account that the learned Jew Matthew was no doubt quite familiar with, that it was Matthew then, the Gospel writer Matthew, who put two and two together. And he saw the relationship between the Magi's visiting the Christ child in Bethlehem and the Balaam story. Later on in Matthew chapter 2, Matthew again exposes his Jewish mindset and Bible knowledge by connecting a prophecy found in Hosea 11.1 1 with Yeshua. Because there we read, when Israel was a child, I loved him and out of Egypt I called my son." So one must ask, how does Matthew legitimately transfer the meaning of Hosea's words, which clearly has Israel in mind, to Yeshua? Now we discussed last week that the Jews used and continue to use four different methods for interpreting Holy Scripture, and one of those standard methods is called remez, meaning hint. Hint. Now, only an educated Jew like Matthew would even be aware of these kinds of interpretation techniques and be able to deftly apply them to the situation of Joseph, Mary, and Jesus fleeing to Egypt to avoid being murdered by King Herod. So here is early evidence in the book of Matthew that Matthew was determined in his gospel to show his readers something of supreme importance, something that has been all but lost within Christianity. It is the proper relationship between Christ and the Torah and the prophets. And at the same time, as we're going to see later, 
questioning, if not rejecting, many of the views and teachings of the synagogue authorities of that era, the scribes and the Pharisees. Why? Because so many of those views were based on man-made traditions and customs that were not founded on actual biblical truth. So taking Matthew's lead, we will continue today to do our best to put on a Jewish mindset in order to best understand what the Jewish Matthew is telling us, but also to take the Bible for what it says and avoid filtering those words through long-held Christian tradition. Now we ended our study last time <clears throat> with the death of King Herod in 4 BC, about two years after Yeshua's birth. And with Herod's unconscionable slaying of those children in Bethlehem and nearby areas because of his paranoia that the Magi were right. A new king of the Jews had been born. So that meant Herod's hold on power might be challenged. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. We're going to start reading at verse 16, go on to the end. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, that's on page 1225. 1225. So Matthew chapter 2, verse 16. <clears throat> Meanwhile, when Herod realized that the Magi had tricked him, he was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in and around Beit Lechem who were two years old or less, calculating from the time that the Magi had told him. In this way <clears throat> were fulfilled the words spoken through the prophet Yirmiyahu, that's Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah sobbing and lamenting loudly. It was Rachel sobbing for her children refusing to be comforted because they're no longer alive. <clears throat> After Herod's death, an angel of Adonai appeared in a dream to Joseph, Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, go to Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, for those who wanted to kill the child are dead. So he got up and he took the child and his mother and went back to Eretz Israel. However, when he heard that Archelaus had succeeded his father Herod as king of Judah, he was afraid to go there. Warned in a dream, he withdrew to the Galil, to the Galilee, settled in a town called Nazaret, Nazareth, so that what had been spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled that he would be called a Nazrati. <clears throat> now, before we move on, it's important that we notice something else about Matthew's gospel that supplies an important backdrop for, for his presentation. It is that there's this strong connection present in Matthew between Moses' life and Yeshua's. I don't think it's too strong to say that Matthew makes Jesus a kind of second Moses. And while that thought might at first unsettle us, when we look at it from the 30,000 foot view, it makes sense. To begin with, in the Torah, we hear these words from Moses in Deuteronomy 18, 14 through 19. For these nations which you are about to dispossess, listen to soothsayers and diviners. But you, Adonai your God does not allow you to do this. Adonai will raise up for you a prophet like me from among yourselves, from your own kinsmen. You're to pay attention to him. Just as when you were assembled at Horev, 
and requested Adonai your God, don't let me hear the voice of Adonai my God anymore or let me see the great fire ever again. If I do, I'll die. On that occasion, Adonai said to me, they are right in what they are saying. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their kinsmen. I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I order him. Whoever doesn't listen to my words, which he'll speak in my name, he will have to account for himself to me. The biggest error that the Hebrews of old and I think believers today make regarding understanding prophecy is that they and we don't take it literally enough. When we look back at the prophecies that have already been fulfilled, invariably they have hit the nail on the head, including details that may have seemed improbable or not comprehensible until these fulfillments finally occurred. The near universal tendency in Christian academic circles of teaching prophecy allegorically because the scholar just can't see how the event can happen literally as the Bible predicts takes believers on wild goose chases or builds false expectations and it's completely unnecessary. Some of this is due to our impatience. We want to know the outcome of a prophecy in advance rather than waiting for it to actually happen. And the result is that rampant speculation is substituted for fact, and then it's adopted by the eager student or congregation as just a settled matter. When Moses said that he would raise up a prophet like me, like him, from among Israel, it happened exactly as he said. So it should be no surprise to anyone that the Messiah would be that prophet and that the similarities between he and Moses would be extensive. I mean, one of the reasons I address this with you is because many modern Bible scholars and the commentaries they write, these are from commentators who are usually skeptical of the ancient biblical record, takes the many similarities that we find here between Jesus and Moses as an indication that the entire story of Christ is suspect and contrived because it bears such a resemblance to Moses and his experiences. <laughs> but they're completely ignoring that such resemblance is exactly what was prophesied by Moses in the Torah. Now, I've explained in previous lessons that perhaps Christ's overriding and underlying theological purpose is to inaugurate a re-creation. Genesis opens with the first heavens and earth, and the book of Revelation ends with the re-creation of a new heavens and new earth and Yeshua is at the center of it all. Therefore, it should not be surprising that while Moses was God's first mediator and brought God's word in stone to God's people, Yeshua was God's second and better mediator and was himself God's word in the flesh brought to God's people. Moses was the father's agent of redemption for God's people in one capacity. Jesus was also the father's agent of redemption for God's people, but in another and even greater capacity. I mean, I could go on and on with the many similarities, but time just doesn't permit. So just be acutely aware of the Yeshua-Moses connection that Matthew has in mind as we study his gospel. Now, verse 17 explains 
that with this mass homicide that King Herod perpetrated upon helpless children, simply because any Jewish boy under two might have been the new king that the Magi came to find, it was itself a fulfillment of prophecy according to Matthew. He quotes from Jeremiah 31, 14, maybe 15, it depends on your Bible version. This is what Adonai says, a voice is heard in Ramah lamenting and bitter weeping. It's Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children because they're no longer alive. Now Matthew connects Rachel weeping and refusing to be comforted because her children are no longer alive with the mass slaughter of Jewish children by Herod that would have devastated the entire Jewish community. However, context is everything. And so as good students of God's Word, we need to continue reading in Jeremiah. So now we're going to go on after 14. This is what Adonai says, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamenting, bitter weeping, it's Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children, because they are no longer alive. This is what Adonai says, stop your weeping, dry your eyes, for your work will be rewarded, says Adonai, they will return from the enemy's land. So there is hope for your future. Your, church, your children will return to their own territory. When we add in more context, we see that although Rachel is weeping uncontrollably at the moment, God tells her to stop because there's hope. Be aware that when Jeremiah mentions, mentions Rachel, who was one of Jacob's wives, it is using her name as representative of some or perhaps all of Israel. Many Christian scholars scratch their heads over Matthew 2 verse 18 because the connection between Rachel weeping and the murder of small children in Bethlehem shortly after Jesus' birth is weak, if not close to irrelevant. So what's Matthew's intent? It seems to me that once again, we see Matthew's Jewish mindset at work. Because again, he's employing one of the four Jewish methods of Bible interpretation. Perhaps Ramez, although in this case, I think it would be the Drash method. And he does this in order to connect the Jeremiah prophecy to the horrific murdering of Jewish children by Herod. In other words, Matthew sees a firm relationship between the two events that occurred far apart in history. Now on the surface, Jeremiah's prophecy is not a messianic prophecy, but rather it's about return from exile for Israel. Jeremiah lived at the time of the Babylonian conquest of Judea that included the destruction of Solomon's temple and the exile of most of Judea's population. Genesis 35, 19 explains that Rachel died on the way to Ephrat. Interestingly, Ephrat was an early name for Bethlehem. Yet Jeremiah's prophecy can't be primarily about the Babylonian exile because Rachel's children, follow me, Rachel's children are Joseph and Benjamin, plus Dan and Naphtali through her handmaiden Bilah. So while in Egypt, Rachel's son Joseph fathered two sons of his own, Ephraim and Manasseh. Ephraim and Manasseh together represent the bulk of the ten northern tribes of Israel that were conquered by Assyria around 720 BC and then scattered all over their empire. The territory of Benjamin was like a buffer state between the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, so there were mixed loyalties among the Benjamites. That part of Benjamin that was loyal to the northern kingdom went into exile with them, 
That part that was loyal to the southern kingdom remained in the land, but would themselves be exiled upon the Babylonian conquest that occurred 130 years later. So God seems to be telling Rachel to stop weeping because all of the exiles of Israel, both the northern and southern kingdoms, perhaps even the dead ones, will eventually return to the Holy Land. Now, notice the common elements of Matthew's narrative that include Egypt, Bethlehem, and the murder of Israelite children. All of these apply both to Rachel's children and to Christ's birth story. In the end, despite the gut-wrenching disasters associated with the two exiles and the murder of the innocents, God says there's hope. So hope is actually the theme. The underlying connection seems to be that there is hope for Israel's return from exile, and there is also hope that it is the Messiah that will manifest that return. The good news is the Messiah has been born. A Jewish reader in the first century might catch on to all this that I've just told you about. But a Gentile reader? Oh, he would have found it most difficult to understand what Matthew's getting at. But now you know. Starting in Ma and, uh, verse 19, we're told that once Herod died, an angel came in a dream to Joseph as he and his family were still in Egypt, and then the all clear was given to him to return home. However, when Joseph heard that it was Herod's son Archelaus that replaced his father, Joseph decided to go to the Galilee instead of returning to Judea. Seems that Archelaus assumed control over Judea, Samaria, and Idumea. Joseph's decision to avoid Judea was a wise one, because Archelaus turned out to be at least as brutal as his father. In fact, his cruelty so alarmed Rome that they finally stepped in and replaced him with a Roman governor in 6 AD, and from that point forward, only Roman governors ruled Judea and the region. Galilee where Joseph took his family and neighboring Perea, they were put under the control of another of Herod's sons, Antipas. He was somewhat a more reasonable ruler, so the area was generally peaceful and secure. Now for verse 23. And frankly, this verse is problematic and there's not much way around it. The first half of the verse is simple enough because it identifies Nazareth as the town that Joseph and his family settled in. Now, Nazareth, like almost all of Galilee, was agricultural. It was small. It was an insignificant place. Perhaps Joseph chose it just for that reason, so that they could be inconspicuous as a protection for his son, Yeshua. The problem part of this verse is the second half. Matthew claims the fulfillment of yet another prophecy and supposedly quotes scripture from some unnamed prophet that says that the Messiah will be called a Nazarene or in Hebrew a Nazrati. No known scripture or combination of scriptures does that. Several possibilities to solve this dilemma have been suggested. I'm just going to briefly go over them. First is that the intention was to say that Christ became a Nazarite. Nothing in the New Testament, nothing in his actions imply that he ever took the vows of a Nazarite. Second is that the meaning is that a Nazarene is what a resident of Nazareth is called. And third, is that the word comes from the Hebrew term nezer, which means branch. 
So that connects Yeshua to Isaiah 11.1. 1. But a branch will emerge from the trunk of Jesse, a shoot will grow from his roots. Now, I'm a simple guy, so I favor simple solutions. In John's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 44 through 46, we read, Philip was from Beit Sada, right, Bethsaida, the town where Andrew and Kepha, Peter, lived. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we found the one that Moses wrote about in the Torah, also the prophets, it's Yeshua ben Yosef of, from Natseret. Nathanael answered him, Natseret, can anything good come from there? Come and see, Philip said to him. See, the point is this. Natseret, Nazareth, was apparently a town that was often the brunt of jokes for some reason. Can anything good come from that town? So people who lived there were considered to be living in just a, a worthless place. Therefore, any resident of Nazareth took on that same worthless character as the town. Don't we all make a junk about some place called Podunk? You want to be a Podunkian? So to be called a Nazarene, a Natsrati, identified a person who lived in a place that was just unworthy of mention. To me, that fits very well with the characterization of Yeshua as a humble man from a humble place. A Messiah and a King who was anything but prominent, aristocratic, charismatic in appearance, all things that humans tend to value, but God doesn't. Let's move on to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it's at the bottom of page 1225. 1225. <clears throat> It was during those days that Yochanan, John the Immerser, arrived in the desert of Judah and began proclaiming the message, Turn from your sins to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is the man, Yeshayahu, Isaiah, was talking about when he said, The voice of someone crying out, In the desert prepare the way of Adonai, make stra straight paths for him. Yochanan, John, wore clothes of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Yerushalayim, from all of Judah, from the whole region around the Jordan, confessing their sins. They were immersed by him in the Jordan River. But when Yochanan saw many of the Parushim and Sadukim, Pharisees and Sadducees, Coming to be immersed by him, he said to them, You snakes, who warned you to escape the coming punishment? If you have really turned from your sins to God, produce fruit that will prove it. And don't suppose you can comfort yourselves by saying, Avraham is our father, for I tell you that God can raise up for Avraham sons from these stones. Already the axe is at the root of the trees, ready to strike. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is going to be chopped down, thrown in that fire. It's true that I am immersing you in water so that you might turn from sin to God, but the one coming after me is more powerful than I. I'm not even worthy to carry his sandals. He will immerse you in the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, and in fire. He has with him his winnowing fork, and he will clear out his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn, but burning up the straw with unquenchable fire. Then Yeshua came from the Galilee to the Jordan to be immersed by Yochanan. But Yochanan tried to stop him. You are coming to me, 
I ought to be immersed by you. However, Yeshua answered him, let it be this way now, because we should do everything righteousness requires. Then Yohanan John let him. And as soon as Yeshua had been immersed, he came up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God coming down upon him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. I am well pleased with him. In this chapter, Matthew quickly turns from the birth of Messiah and then all the circumstances that surrounded that to John the Baptist. In fact, Matthew suddenly jumps over about 30 years. That is, Christ's entire childhood is not discussed. The Gospel of Mark does the same thing. Only Luke's Gospel spends any time with Yeshua's youth, and if you'd like to know more about it, just read Luke 2.21-52. through 52. Now, most scholars attribute this curiosity to Matthew essentially copying Mark's interests and style. Now, we've already discussed that the historical record provided by the earliest church fathers is that whatever copying was done, was done by Mark. Since Matthew's was the first gospel account written according to these same early church fathers. But I think that what we need to be focusing on is that Matthew was certainly a Jew, and near as certainly so was Mark. Luke, on the other hand, was just as certainly a Gentile. He was Dr. Luke, the one who accompanied Paul on some of his journeys. So for the Jews, Matthew and Mark, Yeshua's youth was relatively unimportant. It's his adult life that mattered. But for the Gentile Luke, who thought and, and, and wrote as a Gentile and for Gentiles, remember how he constructed Christ's genealogy, not as Hebrews did, but rather as Gentile Romans did in his era. Well, Yeshua's youth was an important part of Luke's story, and his mostly Gentile readers, and probably his patron, would have wanted to know about it. Verse 1 begins, in those days, or during those days. See, this is just an indefinite term that simply means some amount of time has passed, and entirely new circumstances are about to be discussed. In this case, the time that has passed from the end of chapter 2 is three decades plus or minus a couple years. This new circumstance involves a very strange yet passionate man called John the Baptist. Now, John, of course, was not his birth name. It's just an English-sized version of Yochanan. In Hebrew, Yochanan means Yehovah shows favor, not God shows favor. Matthew characterizes John as a preacher. And his starting point of preaching is said to be in the wilderness of Judea. Now, for anyone who's been to Israel, Jerusalem, and south of it, it quickly becomes apparent that the wilderness, wilderness does not mean densely forested hills and valleys. Rather, it is a stark and mysterious desert. Matthew also always refers to John, interestingly, as John the Baptist, not just John. Mark tends to do that, by the way. He tends to just call John, John. Now, an interesting feature in this chapter, is that just as Matthew jumped completely over Yeshua's youth, he does the same thing with John the Baptist. It's often stated in Christian commentaries that this omission assumes that John and Yeshua were already well known within the Jewish community, as were their birth circumstances, so there was just no need to mention it. 
Perhaps. However, my view is that in Jewish thought and writing, unless the point of a biblical narrative is about a person's time as a youth, like when David was as a teenager, faced down the menacing Goliath, partly as a humiliation of the adult Israelites who were too scared to do it themselves, then the Hebrew cultural value system of placing more value on mature adults than on infants and children, that's what was at play here. Further, since all the Gospels are about a religious matter, and since in Jewish society at that time a man had to be 30 years old to be considered eligible to be a religious authority, then for Matthew, what those two men did as youth just wasn't relevant. Now, when we consider that Yeshua grew up in distant and tiny Nazareth, and John was this strange man who lived the later part of his youth in a desolate desert, then whatever encounters the Jewish public may have had with these two as youth must have been few and far between. So it's difficult to imagine the local Jewish society being familiar with Yeshua's and Yochanan's infancy and youth. Now it is significant for us to gain what the term baptize meant to Jews in the first century. Because whenever whatever we find in the New Testament about baptize and baptizing is meant to be taken in that context. We're going to discuss this at length to begin our next lesson. What I can tell you for the moment is that Christian tradition has altered the meaning of the term and the means of performing it. Now John the Baptist brings two critical messages to the Jewish public. Repent for your sins and the kingdom of God is near. They are at once two different things and yet they are intimately related. As David Stearns aptly says in his New Testament commentary, the idea of repenting because the kingdom of God is at hand mostly conjures up a picture of some weirdly dressed guy standing on a makeshift box at a busy street car corner shouting at nobody in particular and people avoiding looking at him. So even in the church, the idea of repenting because the kingdom of God is near can bring a communal wince upon congregation members, so much so that the most popular of TV evangelists tries to avoid using those terms. John really doesn't say to repent. He says, turn from your sins. Now the English term repent is an excellent word to abbreviate John's words. See, the Hebrew word teshuvah embodies this concept. Literally, it means to turn or to return. In its Jewish religious sense, it means to turn from one's sins and return to God. So it doesn't only mean to quit your bad behavior. It also includes sincerely and personally recommitting one's life to the Lord and to his ways. You know, an atheist can notice his or her bad behaviors and stop them. But that's not biblical repentance. Reforming one's relationship with the God of the Bible is the other necessary ingredient. Further, Jews rightly acknowledge that even this act of the human will is set into motion by God. We can only repent by God's grace. All else is just a short-lived emotional response to our conscience. 
The second part of John the Baptist's message is that the kingdom of God is near. What exactly is the kingdom of God? What does he mean it's near? And further, what relationship does that have to repentance? We're going to discuss that and more next time.